Hello everyone out there on the internet. Once again, this is Frank. This is Leonard. With the Whiskey Anonymous YouTube channel, podcast, and whatever you want to call it. Today, we have a very special guest, a global brand ambassador for Diageo, Mr. Donald Koval. Good, e- good afternoon, good evening everybody. Good evening. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm that much of a special guest, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. I mean, <laughs> might become a special guest. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as mentioned, uh, Donald is a global brand ambassador for Diageo. So, what do you specifically do for Diageo? Well, this podcast is roughly 10 minutes long, so I'm not sure I can answer that question in that time. <laughs> but uh, basically, my role is to, I look after uh, all 20 eight distilleries that we own, actually all 29, but I can get into the 29th distillery when we talk later on. Yeah. Uh, but we've got so all of our brands, I get I support the development of them, the education of them, working with media, with bloggers, with writers, just to help bring the brands to life. Uh, but when I'm traveling, just now the reason I'm over here is because we're traveling around Southeast Asia doing a educational tour, so training up our teams around the market. So. That's a very quick snapshot. I also help uh, with any new bottlings and liquid selection you know, for special releases. So that's a very, very quick snapshot of what I do. Wow, that's, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. Extensive. Yeah. No two days are the same, which is what I love about this. Nice. Yeah. And how long have you been with Diageo now? So I've been with Diageo now for nearly 10 years, okay. but I've uh, been in the industry for well, close to 18 years. Wow. Now. You might not believe that with this young baby face, but hey. I can assure you that I have. <laughs> you started drinking at the age of five, that's fine. Well, from a responsible <laughs> drinking perspective, I cannot agree to that point. No, no, no. Because <laughs> Diageo only does responsible drinking. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great. Wow. wow. I mean, it's always nice to hear insights of what brand ambassadors do, right? I mean, we've interviewed you know, regional guys, guys that yeah. you know uh, from other brands. Um, and then, but this, I, for me, this is the first time meeting a... Yeah, you tend to find the global guys tend to have a bit more of a different remit to the role because because we're normally based near the facility or near the kind of main base of the, uh, the operations, yeah. etc. We tend to get involved in a lot of different project work as well. So mm-hmm. with, from all the companies, not just us, like, you tend to find there's a slightly different uh, uh, role. But yeah, no two days are the same, so which is why I love this job. Now, I got to ask, uh, real quick, just because we get, you know, there's a particular uh, distillery, uh, the Singleton, or a particular brand. Yes. Right? And certain ones are just for Asia, certain mm-hmm. ones are for US, and certain ones are. That's correct, yeah. Why? I mean, for me, I, I love to try everything. But yep. of course, you know, sometimes sometimes things may not specifically work for Asia. But I mean, is, why do they pick certain ones for, like this one for Asia, particularly? Okay. So. Yeah. The Singleton brand, so if I, in order to tell that story, I'm going to have to take a wee step back in time and tell the story of where the brand came from. Okay. The brand basically exists because long before Diageo was Diageo, the, the company that became Diageo yeah. was looking to compete on a global scale with different uh, brands. And the decision was made that to look at our portfolio. They found the perfect distillery. It was perfect in every single way, bar one, the name. And that distillery was Othrask. So, for those of you who don't know this distillery, it's uh, A is spelled A U C H R O I S K. Oh. So, Othrask. Oh. Which, exactly. So, but uh, the worry was somebody would walk into a bar and go, have an Och, Uch, oh, something else, please. <laughs> uh, and that was the, where the Singleton brand came from because they created the Singleton of Othrask. There's a brand name that people could associate with. And, get used to and follow and understand and trust. When Diageo became Diageo, the, the kind of focus then switched it, for the two companies merged, the focus went to the classic malts, yeah. uh, the classic six, and the single of thrust was put in the cupboard. We then had the same conversation in the, later on in the, uh, 2007, and we're going to try and grow a global brand again, and that was the big, big ambition. And at that time, we actually did the exact opposite from what normal brands would do. Rather than creating a brand, mm-hmm. marketing it, and commercially executing it in market and selling it, what we did was we went to the markets and went, what's doing well and why? What flavor profile works well and why? Yeah. And maybe we went to our distilleries and we found the perfect pockets of the incredible liquid. 
incredible whisky to uh, use in those different regions. So in Asia, we deliberately chose to uh, use the Glenord simply because of that bigger, richer, yeah. more almost kind of hint of sweetness and spiciness that it has in the back of it. And we've got a lot of European oak sherry casks maturing in uh, Glenord distillery. So it was the perfect one to choose for the market. So that's a kind of very quick story yeah. of the Singleton and why it exists. Well, I mean, you're doing a good job, I think. Uh, I, I believe, uh, I think in Taiwan, it's the number one uh, single malt over the particular brand with that starts with an M. Yep. That usually is number one. Yeah, and in Vietnam as well. So Vietnam, there's yeah. other countries as well that it's doing really, really well in. So I think it's it, the important, the, the interesting thing is that it's gone from basically zero in 2008 to this year becoming the fourth biggest selling single malt brand, which is no mean feat. I mean, when you're competing against brands that have got decades worth of uh, uh, history. And I think the interesting thing is actually, while the Singleton brand is fairly new to a lot of people, yeah. Glenord itself was built in 1838. Mm -hmm. wow. So it's got an incredibly long and beautifully prestigious history that is worth telling the story of. So while the Singleton brand is new, yes. the distilleries are very much not. Wow. Um, I'd like to go back actually and on that. You said the, you cover 29 or 28 plus one. Yeah. Um, I thought you might pick up on that one. Um, are those 28 active or just 28 in general? Maybe so, not yeah. Canvas or any of the others that have already closed? No, no, it's okay. We've got 28 active single malt distilleries. Mm -hmm. We've got a uh, one and a half grain distilleries. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason we've got half a grain distilleries is because we share it with somebody else. Okay. But out of the 28 single malt distilleries, they're all active, they're all producing, and they're all running exceptionally well. The 29th, the secret one I was talking about, was for years and years, Diageo have been at the forefront of really trying to look at not just technology development, but looking at understanding distillation better. Not so we can play God or try anything different, but so we can continually continue to develop this wonderful, wonderful category and understand mm -hmm. things better. So in our bottling hall in Leaven, in one of the side buildings, we've actually built, purposely built a distillery that is producing exceptionally high quality scotch, but can flex and we can try new things. So understand why does a whiskey like Clyde Leash come out with this really waxy character? What happens in the process to create that really estery, oily style that we can then understand better? Mm -hmm. And years gone by, just kind of building that, years gone by, if we wanted to try something new uh, in our distilling, distilling uh, play, uh, regime, we would have to have stopped the site. Yeah, and actually lost production. Wow. So in the world of Scotch continually growing, that's not something you want to do. No, so actually having this small site gives us a chance to try these things. And actually everything we produce there is Scotch, it's under SWA regulations, mm -hmm. it's all legally Scotch, but it's all different flavour profiles. And it gives us a chance to try new things. And it's, we've, we've now started talking about it for years. We kept it a secret because we didn't really know what the outcome, what we're going to do with that whiskey. Right. The reality is it's incredibly high quality and majority of the time it's blended away. Yeah. But it can be used in a single malt possibly if you want to. Has it ever been used in a single malt? No. So yeah. we're, the, it's only been really operating for, for about five years properly. Okay. So the reality is we could, in long term, there's no reason why we couldn't. Right. We're talking about doing special projects there so myself and my colleagues could go in and work with the team there yeah. to create something ourselves and our own, our own name. Just, it's, it's got that ability to flex and have, uh, but, but at the minute there's no plans to ever bottle anything for it. On top of that, so we were talking yesterday and earlier about um, innovations, mm -hmm. right? And people are, and uh, other distilleries are saying they're innovating whiskey, you know, they're doing this for the first time. Yeah. But, as you kind of mentioned earlier, you guys have been kind of experimenting, and, yeah. you know, years ago you just never mentioned it, you know, you guys kept it a secret. I think that's probably one of our biggest downfalls is that we've for years not spoken about this kind of stuff. And if I use the example of uh, people talk about finishes in whiskey, yeah, uh, I hate that word finishes. I'm like we we class it as double matured or secondary maturation. And we've been doing not only we've we been doing that for about since well the early nineties. Uh, what we did was actually we purposely built a bodega in Scotland so we could treat the casks ourselves. So for instance. Lagavulin distiller tradition. It's secondary matured in Pedro Jimenez sherry casks. 
we don't necessarily buy those Pedro Jimenez casks from Spain. What we do is we buy the sherry from Spain in bulk. Okay. We season and condition the casks ourselves, mm -hmm. which means we've got hard, far higher control over the quality of them. It's an incredibly labour intensive, incredibly expensive way of doing it, but it means that we get the highest quality of casks all the time because we're having much more internal control over it. Yeah. So, and it means that we then fill them full, let them sit and rest for maybe three months, empty them back out, the, the sherry goes back up into the vat, we then start the process all yeah. over again. Uh, the question normally comes, what do you do with all that sherry eventually? Well, after a while, it takes on too much of the wood, so we actually just send it to one of our biodiversity plants mm. that uh, it's got uh, a, the way of extracting the alcohol mm. uh, from it. So we just extract the alcohol, it becomes a safe liquid that can be used and drained away and put into the system. But the whole principle of the data is that we want to be able to uh, try new things yeah. and control the cask. So we've got vats of different types of sherry, of port, but even bourbon. Wow. Do you, have, do you ever do you have a drink of that devil's cut, as they call it in the US? The, you squeeze out the... To be honest, I've not done that since my, my early days in the industry. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I've had uh, good experiences and bad experiences, so I just tend to like, leave it alone now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, trust, I trust our blenders, so they really put in the bottle is of exceptional quality, so I just trust the bottle. Fair enough. It is. Fair enough. That, you know, because, I mean, that's... Uh, another brand, in, but a U.S. bird in uh, Jim Beam, mm. right? They, they call, you know, they particularly market a particular bottle called the Devil's Cut. Yeah, and they squeeze it out. I mean, I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to say anything about it. I don't know, but it's it's interesting. And that's exactly it. At least in the bottles, just they tell a story. They tell a historic story in the industry. Yeah. They just keep these wonderful stories alive. Yeah. So actually, yeah, it's good. That's awesome. There's, how many master blenders does the actual have? I mean, there's one for each of the story. Uh, no, so what we've got is we've got a team of uh, 12 uh, master blenders, all, uh, wow. Wow. all okay. under the steward, at different levels in, the, in time yeah. in, their, in, their, in their careers. Some fairly brand new, some all just classified as blenders, some have the well-deserved title of master blender. Under the stewardship and management of uh, Dr. Jim Beveridge, who mm. is just one of the most influential men in the whiskey industry, and like uh, the only man in the world of whiskey, and that's whiskey bracket C as well, to ever be awarded the title of uh, Master Blender of the Year twice. So he's held that title twice, which is quite the honour for him, and muchly deserved. But below him, there's an incredible team of uh, Master Blenders, including uh, the person who's responsible mainly for our malts, uh, Maureen Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, who was the world's first female Master Blender. Right. She just served, uh, she just, just this year celebrated her 40th uh, anniversary at the actual. Wow. wow. So there's very few people that have got the same level of experience as Moby. That's great. So what are we gonna let's uh, <clears throat> let's taste this whiskey. I know I'm being kind of thirsty. Then we'll yeah. tell more stories about the Agio. Yeah. This is obviously very interesting. I am learning so much it's more about Diageo yeah. than I've ever, you know, have had to learn trying to research. So we had a good company, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it gets <laughs> easily bashed because we're big, but we're a good company. Uh, yeah, you guys are great. So uh, what are what we're tasting right now is the Talisker 25, right? We are indeed the mic. So Talisker, this is it. This is the Talisker 25. It's now a permanent member of the Talisker family. For years, it was only ever occasionally a one-off special mm -hmm. release, right. and it was quite. Uh, all, you occasionally found it, occasionally you didn't. Now it's such a permanent member of the family. And this Talisker bottling is for me, it shows exactly why Scotch is the world's favourite whisky. Mm -hmm. It's the incredible diversity of flavour. So, what everybody should find in every Talisker is four things a smokiness, a spiciness, a saltiness, yeah. and a sweetness. Yeah. How they manifest themselves is entirely up to that individual. Right. So, you guys at home, when you pick up a Talisker, any Talisker, 10, Sky, Storm, a Distiller Tradition, I could go on, there's quite a few. <laughs> uh, but you should find one of those big flavours. And that to me is why it's that perfect whisky for everybody. Because you get people who love outdoor whiskies. They tend not to navigate their way into space side whiskies that often. Yeah. They like the bigger, punchier flavours. You've got the space side guys who tend not to venture to outdoor because mm -hmm. it's too big for them. Right. This is the perfect middle ground. This is where everybody comes to meet. It's the meeting place of flavour. 
in the world of whisky because the space side guys can find that sweetness and the richness that they want. The peat freaks, guys who love their peaty whisky. Yeah. Uh, God bless you all. <laughs> uh, they're the guys who can come here and find the big powerful flavours they like as well. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm teasing you this. No, it's a yeah, no, it's it's beautiful, beautiful nose. Yeah. Just, this is all that's ribbon? So yes, I'm like almost almost exclusively we mature Talisker in American oak bourbon casks. Uh, predominantly we fill American oak because actually Talisker is such a wonderful distillery character. We want the flavours to shine through yeah. and really be, be, be prominent, which sounds crazy considering it's a big whiskey, but you don't really want that conflicting big rich first 12 flavours yeah. competing with it. So, But actually the only time we really use uh, sherry casks or European oak is in the uh, uh, distiller tradition. Mm -hmm. We're second to mature it in Amoroso casks and in the Talisker Port Tree, which you guys might not be as familiar with, no. but it's a, a variant that's available mainly in Western Europe. But it's a, it's, it's a Talisker that's been second to matured in a port casks. Okay. Which tells the story of actually Talisker dating back to 1864 when actually we can, we've got records of Talisker trading with Portuguese merchants to buy port casks. Mm -hmm. And tuning their whiskey and port pipes, oh, right, right. dating back to then. So that's just a bit of a nod and a wink to the history of the oh, that's pretty cool. Now, this is just something I want to ask because, um, based on what I've heard, be, um, a lot of the Scottish distilleries on the islands. Okay. Um, how big is the operation at Talisker? It's just a uh, over three million liters of alcohol per year, so it's not big. It's not big. Yeah. Wow. In comparison, so at one point that would have been huge, but yeah. in modern times, when you look at Glenord for us now is up at 12 million litres of alcohol per year. Really? Uh, so in, in the grand scheme of things, it's not huge. Yeah. And how many people are in the actually in the distillery? Is it mostly automated or? <clears throat> no, 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 not one of our distilleries is fully automated. Mm. Uh, I mean, yes, we've got yeah. computers in there, but everyone comes around, I'm like, you go into the control room and it looks like the deck for the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality yeah. is that's all there to make the role safer, more yeah. efficient more uh, well, easier on the guys, of course. but it's still them who are making decisions on cut points. It's still the guys and girls who work there who are making uh, decisions on when to mash in and when it, if everything's okay with that process. Uh, so while all the machines there tell them what's happening, they don't make the decisions. And it'd almost be impossible really to, for me, to fully automate it in the same way that these guys can, and girls can do it. Works. So to answer your question on Talisker, there are, a, get my numbers right here, there are 14, 12 or 14 operators okay. working two, two at a shift. Uh, there are a, a team of management, a, three managers. There's a senior manager, facility manager, and then there's the visitor centre manager. Yeah. But the biggest employer on the, on the site is actually our visitors, visitor uh, centre. Yeah. We welcome, welcomed last year 68,000 visitors wow. to, Scala, to Talisker. And uh, the, the interesting thing with that is actually, and I apologise to anybody that's happened to, but the sheer volume of traffic we get there, it becomes really hard for us to see everybody. So we're in a position that actually, because so many people come to see us, if you don't book, it can be really problematic oh, to get a tour, to get a visit. So yes, yeah, so apologies if you have experienced that, but it's almost quite humbling that so many people come and see us. But the biggest part of the employment there is the visitor centre. So I gotta email you first to get my private tour with you around the distillery, right? Oh, if it's me, <laughs> me, if me and you, I'll take it myself. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. No, it's interesting because a lot of, um, especially when it comes to island, to the islands, um, you know, you hear about like, yeah, we're a, we make a distillery, we're, we're an island of 180 people. So when we have a, when, when the distillery is running, we employ about 40% of the island. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and when you visit, you represent 0.5% of the population, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's a... Uh, you, <laughs> it's a good idea. You look at Isla, it's a... Uh, so many people are employed by the facilities in Isla, all eight of them, but yeah. it's not just the people who are employed, it's the people who are indirectly employed as well. So right. the people who are indirectly uh, benefiting from the facilities. Like the bed and breakfast, the, 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 yeah. the restaurants, the shops, the petrol station, the ferry service. Right. The, the, even even the guys who do the, the the fuel deliveries because at the end of the day the facilities are probably one of their biggest customers. Yeah, of course. Just, and, yeah, and awesome. so on and so on. Excellent. Well, let's uh, let's get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cheers, cheers, French. Cheers. Yeah. cheers. Like I said uh, earlier, this has a great nuttiness to it. Mm. Um, I've noticed that I just did not get the uh, earlier. Yeah. Oh. 
the smoky, that's the thing with this, there's all the kind of milk chocolatey nuttiness to it, so it's almost like a, nut, a chocolate nut bar, but there's a real spicy kick at the end, so it's a weird combination of both chilli heat and cinnamon. Mm -hmm. So you've got that kind of sweet spice and that heat spice, for me. Uh, uh, what's the ABB on this? So all taskers, uh, bar one, yeah. uh, and any special bottlings we do one off, are 45.8, okay. which is the exact equation of a hundred eight eighth proof. Now, I know we've had this conversation <laughs> before, that obviously like any of your American followers uh, who believe that the exact way to do the equation is to divide it by two, eighth proof divided by two. Unfortunately, that's what our American cousins do, no disrespect. <laughs> but there is a proper equation you can use, and that equates to 45.8%. So, yeah, at 45.8, that basically means that no talisker then can ever have chill filtering. Well, no, that, or, no that's false. Because that there are bourbons right? out there that are chill filtered that are 50%. So, my, the, the whole chill filtering debate is I mean, in theory, we could chill filter because it is still, it's. The alcohol strength is relative, and like some some whiskies, because of the viscosity of them, the oiliness of them, yeah. mm -hmm. the makeup of them, actually could be a uh, fine at forty six. But some actually could still go cloudy and everything else. Right. And right. The whole reason behind it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in theory, we could. Uh, some talisers possibly are yeah. because they are more uh, bigger volumes, mainstream. So, right. and there is a like. Let's be honest, I mean, the reason why people chill filter, I know it's a hotly debated conversation, yeah, the reality is not everybody is educated as everybody watching this yeah. uh, podcast. Like, unfortunately, we get to a stage that occasionally somebody could go, oh, my whiskey's broken, and I want to take it back to the store. And in an ideal world, uh, yeah. we would have everybody yeah. as educated as your general followers, but uh, it's not always the case, so we, we, we have to be able to kind of help stave off those potential Yeah, yeah. for sure. No, but yeah, no, um, I was doing so research on, okay. about chill filtration. Yeah. I've seen bourbons, because part of our website is uh, we have lots of guest reviewers. Okay. And, you know, I want to keep consistency, so I, I have a part on there that says chill, for, chill filtration, yes or no. And I think uh, certain whiskey, like a Blanton's, which is higher ABV, then research it, chill filter. And, you know, 50%, which is amazing. You wouldn't think you would need to. Yeah. Yeah, because well, most scotches have a policy of not of being not forty six normal threshold, yeah. but yeah, it does it does depend on the the, the viscosity and the oiliness. Yeah, so it goes in both directions as well because I've seen yeah. uh, non chill filtration at forty percent. Exactly. So it can go. So there really is no uh, standard. Or there isn't. I mean, the, there's a, there's like a kind of a baseline that's pretty much a good rule of thumb if you know. But there is there is kind of other ways to think about it. So it's like, but it, it is generally, if you think about it, it's like give or take 46%, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's the safe code. Yeah. yeah. Not to this then. You want a little water just to. I'll, I'll, take, another, I'll take another taste at first because okay. uh, the first one is always could be deceiving, so you have to take at least seven more before you find out what you're doing. So, <laughs> but uh, we were talking about this yesterday. This is one of those you should add water, open it up a little bit. To be honest, I well, you might refuse point black to give that. A oh, God, of course. No, no. So, like, one of my things is that I, I never, I never would expect somebody in, in Costa or Starbucks to tell me how to drink my coffee. So I can never tell somebody how to drink their whiskey. So what I always recommend, and like I know you, you guys all know this, yeah. but a, uh, I, one of my biggest frustrations is to hear somebody say in a, in a bar, oh, you'll need a drop of water with that. Yeah, yeah. How would you possibly know that? How could you possibly know what my taste buds are? Fair enough. Uh, so for me, I would say uh, always, the first time you try a whiskey, try it neat first, yeah. enjoy it. If you find at that moment it's either too harsh, too sharp, too big, adding a drop will help. But the next time you try it, your palate can be completely changed. Yes, true. And actually, you'll not need any water. So yeah. It's not just dependent on the person, it's depending on the time as well. I, oh, Sorry, it's one of my runs. No, no, you know what, I agree. I actually. That's how I always, for me, I always tell people, at least try the whiskey series. You know, yeah. just, just see what it is. Then afterwards, maybe you might need water, maybe you might need a cube of ice, depending on how your taste. For me, yeah. I only drink my water straight. I mean, not water, but my whiskey straight. I drink water straight too. Yeah, we drink our water straight. <laughs> it's good advice. Yeah, it's, or we drink water straight. No, but, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just, I'm not going to tell anyone how to drink, because that's how. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, at least. Try for yourself, but you know, 
a yeah, certain you way. You can gain, you can't tell. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just added some water um, right now, a couple of drops, and I can tell you, honestly, it's different. But, yeah. And I won't even say it's better. I'm going to say it's just a different flavor altogether. Yeah, because I miss when it was neat. I found it had the perfect amount of spiciness. I really like that. Yeah, a bite to it. Yeah, yeah it, it, it had the perfect amount of bite because it didn't. It didn't cause my taste buds to start shouting and overloading. It didn't cause it to, but it caused it to stand up. Yeah, take, stand up and take notice. Yeah, um, brought a really good amount of, and we uh, part that uh, we have really talked about is the salinity. It really has a really nice uh, salty edge Brainy to it. Edge yeah, that nice bready edge, but really counters that sweetness upon entering that chocolate because the chocolate comes in front. Yeah, yep. And then uh, that salinity comes after, so it really rounds it out very yeah. well. Yeah. Now it's a, little, it's a little bit more subdued. A little bit of water. Yeah, yeah. A little bit more. It's nice. Um, the for me. The peatiness kind of starts hiding a little bit when you add a little water, yep. but it's still there. It's just not as pronounced. Yeah, for me, when I when I drink this whole, uh, uh, I tend to have it just one large large cube of ice. Okay. So avoid dilution. Right. But I'm getting so we've got a chill because you tend to find that the colder the cold whiskey gets, for me it brings out a lot of smoke. Okay. So actually mm. to that point, adding this room temperature water in there. Does tend to subdue it for me, yeah. But again, that's my personal taste. Yeah, of course, yeah. No, well, it brings up the cocoa a bit. Uh, I get more cocoa. I've got a little more of a chocolate edge to it. Yeah. So once that is less, you, if you like coffee, yeah, a little water brings out that bitterness, that coffee yeah. cocoa bitterness. Probably yeah. high, probably because it hides the smoke beat a bit. So right. Other flavors could be more pronounced. Well, yeah, with that salty, almost that salty chocolate caramel. Can yeah. yeah. Consider that salty caramel. Chocolate. But I can't say that that's better. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. It's different. It's different. It's good. I mean, definitely more salty now. For me, yep. yeah. So, anyways, so for me, obviously, it's a good whiskey. I, I'm not going to complain any one bit about this. I don't even have to do a thumbs up, thumbs down. This is wonderful. If you guys do get the chance, definitely try it. Um, any any other uh, thoughts before we uh, close out this particular episode? Yeah. Um, last bit of the 27. Since you uh, are a part of 27 distilleries, which the 28, no, 28 plus nine plus one. Yeah, sorry, 28 plus one. Which one would you recommend me and Frank visit first? Oh, oh, oh good question. So, <clears throat> if I'm going to be all politician on you and say that it's a really hard question to answer because obviously I love all of my of visitor centers, and, but I, f I have to think of them in the same way that my mum thinks about me and my brothers. She loves us all, but occasionally on one day she loves the other one more than the other. Mm -hmm. So, what's hey, your uh, today, choice of today? today, today. So our, I have our 12 distilleries, there's a couple that are really worthwhile. So if you land into Edinburgh, yeah. uh, I would definitely recommend making a beeline for our Blade Apple distillery, okay. which is not one you probably expect me to recommend, but they've just installed something really cool mm. there. What they've done is, and if you, uh, you can search for this link online, mm. they've, they've, we've put a video up on it. We actually took the old marsh tank from Klein Leash distillery when we were doing the upgrades there, and we've taken it down to Blade Apple, and they've got this wonderful reception area for the visitor centre. And what they've done is they've actually created this really beautiful bespoke bar. Oh, so nice. the bar out of this big mash and it is stunning. It's good. And the thing is, it was, all, it was our engineers who did it all. So it was our guys. That's so cool. there's a real, real passion for it there. Mm -hmm. So that's somewhere to go better because there's a cool bit of uh, kit. Okay. You can sit, relax in that bar. But then you head over to the west coast as well. You've got some stunningly beautiful drives and distilleries. Yeah. Talisker is brilliant, but remember, you have to book. Right. Getting yourself over Tyler is a must. Lagavulin. Ooh. Whenever I go to Lagavulin, because I'm from the West Coast, I'm from Kintyre, I grew up with a lot of people from Ireland. Going to Lagavulin isn't going to walk to me. It's like going home. Right. Yeah. It's just got that wonderful feel to it. So that's a couple of them to go. But if anybody really wants to have a look at our different facilities and visitor experiences, I'd recommend that they go to malts.com. Uh, our website www.malts.com and you get a chance to see the visitor centers all the booking information is there you can book your tour online it's all there that's awesome perfect oh well, great well uh thank you very much for uh, watching guys and uh, stay tuned for our next episode which we will be talking about the lagavulin swell thank you very much bye-bye